back again with another video reaction and we're doing something a little different today my name is Josh thanks for checking out the channel by the way and if you click the thumbnail you're here to check out something that I haven't done before but I wanted to check with you guys and see if you were interested in watching at all with me because if you're unfamiliar the critical drinker is a YouTube content creator I believe primarily on YouTube that uh, makes some kind of reviews of di different types of entertainment whether it be shows or movies and things like that but he's a very <laughs> He's got a very interesting sense of humor, very dry. I believe he's a Scottish guy. Uh, he also is pretty critical of a lot of things and is very much so of the mindset of he very much just kind of tells it how he believes it is. And oftentimes, I think with the videos that I've watched and listened to, I, I, I agree with a lot of what he says most of the time. But it's also just very, very funny and comical how he presents it. I mean, he's very he's a jackass. Let's just put it that way for sure. Very blunt. But that doesn't mean, again, that some of the stuff that is in there isn't true or that it's at least rooted in some actual facts and some of the stuff that he's talked about recently especially with like Disney and Marvel stuff is is kind of how I found him because I was watching a couple of his things and I was like yeah he's absolutely right and he's one of the first bigger media outlets or at least YouTube commentators that I watch to really kind of notice and say something about like Marvel movies haven't been that good Disney's been changing their quality of things a lot and they're focusing on a lot of very politically driven topics that I, I just don't like being forced into media. Again, if it's naturally occurring or you're trying to make a statement about something, that's awesome. But it's they're putting it in everything. And he was one of the first people that really kind of, well, first made light of that and made fun of it. And then also just kind of joked about it and consistently brought it to, I think, a lot more people's attention. So he just put one out that I wanted to react to. And this one's actually about Ahsoka. So Ahsoka is the show that's on Disney+. Plus. That is a Star Wars show that... I honestly probably three years ago, even two years ago, would have been very, very excited about. And I have not watched it because I have been so let down by the Disney shows. I mean, I think actually the Obi-Wan show that was on Disney a couple years ago is one of the first shows that I did a lot of reactions for on this channel because I was so angry about how bad it was. In my opinion, again, everything is subjective, but I couldn't stand it. It was just such horrible garbage and drab and not of the quality you'd expect from a Disney company that has billions of dollars. It, there was a lot of things that made me very upset about that. But anyway, that kind of scorned me from Star Wars. And I grew up a Star Wars fan by far, like all the old movies. Even when I was in, I believe, high school and the prequels came out, I went and seen all of those and enjoyed them enough. I mean, there were definitely some slow, some nonsensical parts. But I mean, you also had some of the Duel of the Fates. I mean, you had some really cool stuff that came out of that. And even the new movies, I went and seen those opening weekend, every one of them, and I had fun with them. Again, there's not great things in all of them, sure, but at the same time, they were fun. And then, like, some of the shows came out. Mandalorian was freaking awesome. The first season, I seen the second season, and then things I started to not watch as much, and then I seen the Obi-Wan one, and then I just kind of gave up on that. The Marvel Universe, I've been close to giving up on. I've really only watched a couple of their movies recently, and only Guardians of the Galaxy 3 was really, really good, in my opinion. I'm getting away from the point of what I wanted to do was react to the new video that he just put out, and this is about Ahsoka. Just because, again, I think his stuff is very well thought through. He's very charismatic. He's very funny, and he's got really good editing skills. So I thought we'd check that out and you guys let me know what you think. All right, let's see what he has to say. So we come at last to the season finale of Ahsoka, the fourth Disney Plus show in a row that's apparently gonna save Star Wars. Because the other three were just warm-up acts, you see. Ahsoka is where we finally got to see Dave Filoni's creative abilities fully unleashed. And oh boy, what an eye-opening experience it was. If I had to sum up Ahsoka in just one sentence, I'd say it's a show of missed opportunities. Just like its main villain, it was given every resource and advantage it could possibly ask for and should have pulled off an easy win, but somehow managed to squander every single one with absolutely zero impact and yet still smugly acted. Real quick, just in case you're unaware, there probably will be spoilers for the actual show in here. It's kind of a review, too, so if you haven't seen it and you want to, probably go watch that first. Alright, you've been warned. As if it had come out on top. 
So fold your arms and paste a blank expression onto your face because we're going in hard and fast with this one. The basic plotline should be familiar to anyone that watched my previous video, but here goes anyway. Ahsoka is on the tail of a witch named Morgan who plans to use a magical bullshit MacGuffin map to travel to another galaxy using the Eye of Sauron and bring back Grand Admiral Thrawn who's been stranded there for the past 10 years after the events of Star Wars Rebels. Along the way she hooks up with a block of wood known as Sabine, who also wants to go to the other galaxy so that she can rescue Ezra Bridger, who got stranded there along with Thrawn. Don't worry though, he's less of a character with his own unique drives and motivations, and more of like a piece of furniture that everyone fights over. Oh yeah, and Hera's also there because she was a character in Rebels. <laughs> anyway, it all goes wrong when Sabine gives the magical bullshit map to Morgan, and Ahsoka gets her ass kicked by one of the only interesting characters in the entire show. But that's okay, because she then teleports to a magic get out of jail free card invented by Dave Filoni and has a hallucination of Anakin. Remember Anakin? Oh, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe he's a force ghost or a fragment of Anakin's consciousness, or Ahsoka's memory of him conjured up by her subconscious mind to try to save her life. I don't really know, and I'm willing to bet that Dave Filoni doesn't know either. It's all down to interpretation, you see. The important thing I learned from that whole episode is that it's better to choose to be alive than dead. Also, REMEMBER ANAKIN? Anyway, so then Ahsoka hitches a ride on a giant space whale that takes her across intergalactic space to the exact planet where Thrawn is stranded, because of Apparently these things travel there on a regular basis. Are you serious? Well, that was lucky, because she would have been kind of fucked otherwise. You know, I've got a few questions about this situation. If the space whales can take you to the exact planet where Thrawn is waiting and back again, then why did Morgan need the Eye of Sauron to get there in the first place? In fact, why did she need the magical bullshit map? Why didn't Thrawn use the space whales to get back to his own galaxy all by himself? I mean, he's supposed to be the smartest guy in the universe or something. you think he would have found a way to make that happen after 10 years. This kind of shit is without doubt Dave Filoni's biggest problem as a writer. Well, apart from his complete inability to write interest in dialogue, or craft stories that are more than just fetch quests for magical MacGuffins, or create people who actually make smart decisions, or his borderline fetish for the boring, mediocre character he's trying so hard to insert as the driving force behind the entire Star Wars narrative. No, it's his constant fucking around and retconning of past events and world building to suit the needs of his own narrow story. It's like he's staying in a hotel room for a couple of days and decided that he now has the right to completely remodel the place because he feels like it. This isn't your job, Dave. You're supposed to work within the rules of the world that George created, not write a whole bunch of new ones just to suit yourself that now affect everyone else. Ah, whatever. So they get mm -hmm. to the planet and Sabine gets reunited with Ezra in the most stale, boring, emotionless reunion scene that I've ever witnessed on screen. Wouldn't want to have our characters display genuine human emotion or vulnerability even for a second, eh? Then Ahsoka shows up and they have a bunch of pointless fight scenes which almost always end in a draw before the plot decides that it's time to wrap this shit up. So Thrawn leaves with the Eye of Sauron and there's more fighting and these red witch ladies turn dead stormtroopers into zombies for some reason and then Thrawn returns to his own galaxy with Ezra on board and Sabine and Ahsoka are left stranded on the planet in a different galaxy. Because I guess they just kind of forgot that they can hitch a ride on the next pod of space whales that show up. Oh and Balin teleports into Lord of the Rings so that he can stare at Mount Doom for a while, and the series ends with a final shot of Force Ghost Anakin. Remember Anakin? Actually, I prefer to imagine that it's really just Hayden Christensen smirking about the whole thing because he knows that every time Disney makes another shitty Star Wars show, the prequel trilogy goes up just a little bit higher in everyone's <laughs> collective memory. I don't like sand. What an absolute shit show this was. I mean, I can't say I expected much from it after the first couple of episodes, but Jesus, somehow it found a way to sink even lower. Nothing that happens in this absolute calamity makes any sense, so it's probably for the best that very little actually happens at all. The only thing that's really changed by the end is that the characters have effectively swapped places. Thrawn and Ezra are back in their home galaxy, while Sabine and Ahsoka are stranded in the other one. Oh! 
Nobody really learns anything, or grows, or changes into a better person in the course of the story. Sabine is just as much of a smug, boring arsehole as she was at the beginning, played by an actress who's absolutely determined not to show any emotional range whatsoever. Ah, smug mode. Ahsoka is the same bland, humorless, charmless non-entity who walks around extremely slowly, crosses her arms occasionally, and stares at things with great deliberation, only to spout the most simplistic and obvious dialogue that would make a 12-year-old fanfiction writer cringe. She supposedly goes through some kind of spiritual reawakening about the midpoint of the season, but really the only change that comes about is that she's dressed in different clothes afterwards. Fucking hell, remember when character development was a thing? Ezra barely even qualifies as a character, he's just there to do whatever the others tell him to. He happily goes along with every plan, has absolutely no agency or independent thoughts, and never questions anything. In other words, he's a perfect male hero for any modern Disney Star Wars production. Damn man, I can't imagine how crushingly disappointing it must have been for Rebels fans to finally see Ezra and Sabine reunited after 10 years, and all they get is, Hey, how's it going? This is not how human beings are supposed to act. And the thing is, there's a ton of stuff you could have done with these characters if you were a half-decent writer. Ahsoka could have been genuinely tempted by the power of the dark side, just like her former master, struggling to keep anger and vengeance from getting the better of her, especially after losing a battle against Balin and almost dying in the process. Or maybe she's getting older now, and she's very conscious that she's no longer a Jedi at her full potential, but she has to rally herself to go on this one last desperate mission. It would also help to explain why she's so fucking slow during the fight scenes. I mean, it's not exactly original, but it's something at least. Sabine could have been a hot-headed, impulsive wildcard who tries to do everything by herself and fails disastrously, and slowly has to learn to trust and cooperate with others. The show gives us little hints of this kind of character with dialogue, but then it shows us the exact opposite and it creates this weird disconnect. Ezra could have been a driven, intense warrior after spending 10 years fighting to survive on a hostile planet. He might even have been angry that Sabine risked the fate of the entire galaxy just to come after him when he literally sacrificed everything to stop Thrawn once already. I mean, god forbid you have a male character that shows just a tiny bit of backbone. On that subject, actually, it's nice to see the classic Disney two-tier morality system at play in this show. Like, Sabine literally gives up the only thing that could stop Thrawn from returning and launching a genocidal war against the entire galaxy, all to save one man that she personally cares about. It wouldn't be particularly hard to argue that her actions were morally reprehensible, and every subsequent death in the Star Wars universe is completely her responsibility, but she's never once called out on her selfish bullshit. It's just totally hand waved away as a justified and completely acceptable decision. Or how about when Hera disobeys direct orders from superior officers and launches an unsanctioned mission into enemy territory that gets several people killed, and then falsifies official instructions to cover her own arse? And you protected the New Republic by ignoring direct orders. No, I protected the New Republic by ignoring you. She gets nothing but a wink wink, I know what you did and I'm totally cool with it from Mon Mothma, whereas Poe Dameron did the exact same thing in TLJ, but actually accomplished a lot more than Hera, and got a slap in the face and an instant demotion for his troubles. But yeah, sure, I guess stuff like this is okay when a woman does it. Wouldn't want to hold them accountable for their own actions or anything, would we? I said before that Ahsoka is a show of missed opportunities, and no character personifies this problem more than Thrawn himself, a villain that's been built up up relentlessly as the Thanos of the Star Wars universe, but when he actually waddles onto the screen in his cheap, badly fitting uniform and beer gut, he's about as intimidating as a fucking plush toy. He consistently makes terrible tactical decisions, squanders his vastly superior forces by feeding them piecemeal into the battle, withdraws for no reason when he's got the heroes dead to rights on multiple occasions, and constantly delays his escape to give them time to catch up to him. His entire presence in this show is nothing but a constant stream of blunders and cost defeats, but he somehow acts like he's some grand strategist who always intended for it to play out this way. As Little Platoon so rightly pointed out, he's a stupid person's idea of what a smart person should be, yeah. doing incredibly <laughs> dumb things hidden behind a thin veneer of cool, composed intellectualism. Personally though, I think he's a perfect metaphor for your average Hollywood screenwriter, someone who constantly manages to fail upwards, spinning every flop and disaster into a subtly orchestrated victory, and deluded into believing their own hype by years of economic 
echo chamber isolation. And I know this is a purely aesthetic thing, but Jesus, even the fight scenes look like absolute dog shit. Almost nobody can move or fight with anything approaching competence, and Rosario Dawson is probably the worst offender. She's only 44, but she moves like a 60 year old, slow and stiff and uncoordinated. You can tell how hard she's having to work just to keep up with the basic fight choreography, and it's made even worse when she's matched up against actors who actually know what they're doing. Hayden Christensen runs rings around her, and you can tell he's having to do the bulk of the work just to make the fight look halfway interesting. Diana Inasato's a martial arts expert, and even though she's more than a decade older, she's so much faster and more coordinated that it's almost embarrassing watching them square off. All of this stuff, the stupidity masquerading as intelligence, the gaping plot holes, the world breaking new technology and plot devices, the lazy and simplistic fight scenes, the complete lack of emotional chemistry, the glacially slow pace and the shameless exploitation of characters and events from far more competent productions all adds up to a show that's just as shitty and forgettable as everything else that Disney Lucasfilm have made. Ahsoka is a show for people who like the idea of Star Wars rather than the reality. People whose collective memory and understanding of the world that George Lucas created extends roughly as far back as the last forgettable Star Wars TV show sharted out onto Disney+. Plus. People who'll clap and cheer and cry like complete idiots at the appearance of something vaguely familiar without pausing for even a second to question why it's there or what the point of it is. It's a perfect example of the old red letter media meme. Don't ask questions, just consume product and then get excited for next product. And now that it has been consumed, the people who pretended to love it with such wild hysteria will forget about it just as quickly as every other shitty Star Wars show that's come and gone over the past few years. And maybe that's the idea. Maybe these are the kind of brain dead simpletons that Disney want to cultivate as fans now. People that will accept any old slop that you serve up because they've lost the ability or the will to expect anything better. And if so, Fuck it, they're welcome to it because I don't give a shit anymore. Star Wars is dead and Dave Filoni did not bring it back. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. Go away now. Okay, so if you are unfamiliar with The Critical Drinker, that was The Critical Drinker. So you could see how... Again, it's kind of a review synopsis kind of mixed in with some of his commentary on, again, just thoughts about the show or movie, but show in this case, and then kind of even some bigger topics that, which is, I think, really why I really kind of continue to watch him as well as a lot of other people. Like, he gets a ton of freaking views, but it's it's literally because of all the stuff he was saying right at the very end there about it just seems so lazy like all of the writing when i was starting to watch the shows that they were putting out and i was like this doesn't even make logical sense why is this and this oh it doesn't matter like but it does it shouldn't shouldn't it a little bit i mean i know you guys have a bunch of people you pay a lot of money you can storyboard this stuff and know that somebody can't go from here to here in the same scene and like little logical gaps that are just missing that really really agitated the crap out of me and especially the freaking obi-wan show it was so bad but uh, more and more of what he's talking about has become more and more obvious of just like okay we'll just throw some cameos in there of different you know very well-loved characters that people had time to build and love and you know really care about and we haven't seen them forever we'll throw them in there and it's worked pretty well sometimes. Again, I'm going to cite Mandalorian Season 2 when you had a little Luke Skywalker cameo. That was maybe one of the coolest things I've seen, and that was relatively recent. They have all the tools there to be able to do good things. It's just like they take the easiest path or the path of least resistance. We're going to do something quick and fast and just throw this out there and put some cameos and some special easter eggs in there for the people that watched all of the animated movies and everything else. But if you are unfamiliar with that, then you don't really need to watch this or you really shouldn't care. I enjoy watching his stuff because it makes me feel like I'm not crazy for thinking these things when I've actually watched some of the shows and or movies. Uh, he just puts it much more eloquently sometimes and a lot more bluntly sometimes than I would, but it's very, very interesting and I definitely tend to agree a good bit and I don't really know that I need to watch the actual Ahsoka show now, so I feel pretty good about that. I don't know. Let me know if you guys have watched it, if you agree with him or have you watched The Critical Drinker before? <laughs> And what do you think of what he had to say? Because I definitely, I'm a fan. It's also just really, really funny how he says things, how he edits and intermingles things. It's uh, pretty straightforward and pretty hilarious. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section. Don't forget, like, share, subscribe. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button if you would. That'd be fantastic. And as always, you're awesome. Peace out.